Sampling Instrumentation for Airborne Nanomaterials. My name is Tom Peters from the University of Iowa. By the end of this module, learners should be able to categorize sampling instrument based on size resolution, time resolution, and concentration metric, describe operating principles of different sampling instruments, list methods used to analyze nanomaterial samples, and interpret output from different kinds of instruments. As we have seen in a previous module, the source of an aerosol defines its size and concentration. Remember, we've expressed an aerosol by different metrics, number, surface area, or mass concentration on the y-axis by particle size on the x-axis. Hot processes create vapors that nucleate or condense to form particles typically smaller than one micrometer in diameter, known as nano, ultrafine, and fine particles. Welding and combustion engines produce these kinds of particles. These aerosols we know as fume, smoke, and smog. They dominate particle number concentration and can be an important component of mass distributions. In contrast, mechanical sources break a bulk material up into coarse particles that are primarily larger than one micrometer, such as in grinding or sanding. These aerosols we know as dust, mist, and spray. They often dominate particle mass distributions but contribute little to particle number concentration. Why are we interested in sampling these particles anyways? Well, there's a variety of reasons. One reason is to show compliance with an exposure limit, such as comparing titanium dioxide concentrations measured in the breathing zone to NIOSH recommended exposure limit. Another reason is to identify and characterize hazard sources, such as determining where particle concentrations are highest in a facility that uses carbon nanotubes to strengthen sporting equipment. Sampling can also be used to demonstrate the effectiveness of controls, such as measuring particle concentrations with and without an exhaust hood in operation, or to evaluate a research hypothesis, such as whether or not silica dust concentrations relate to minor lung health in an epidemiological study. Lastly, sampling is an important step in evaluating risk. Sampling can be used to determine exposure and or dose for a group of workers or to evaluate whether concentrations exceed levels defined to be immediately dangerous to life and health in emergency situations, for example. So the goal of sampling in the context of nanotechnology is to estimate worker exposure to airborne nanomaterials apart from background aerosols that may be present in the workplace. Ideally, we need a tricorder, as originally seen carried by Dr. Spock in a 1960s Star Trek episode. The tricorder is a multifunction handheld device used to sense environmental conditions, analyze and record data, and estimate risk, which comes in handy when you travel to a planet that looks like Earth in the Old West time period. The use I have in mind for such a device is to report nanomaterial number, surface area, and concentration by size. Well, we don't have such a device, although we are working towards this goal. I will, however, review what is available for sampling airborne particles. First, I will address some fundamental concepts and terms that I will refer to throughout the presentation. There are different types of instruments, some called size integrated, while others are called size resolved. So here I show a continuous distribution of the actual number concentration by size. An instrument that integrates over many sizes will provide a single value representing the average particle number concentration across many diameters. In contrast, sizing instruments provide number concentration in many different size bins. Because these data are size resolved, they can be used to estimate particle surface area and mass concentration by size.
we need to first think about the characteristics of the contaminant we are trying to measure. The source of the particles is important. Oftentimes, particles are emitted as a byproduct of an industrial process. Welding fumes are an example of fine and nanoparticles emitted by common industrial processes. In contrast, the product may be the contaminant of interest, such as engineered nanoparticles. In this case, we need to be able to differentiate product from byproduct. Also, we need to know the particle size range we are interested in. For coarse and fine particles, mass-based sampling often has sufficient sensitivity for detection because these particles have sufficient mass to weigh. Gravimetric sampling is favored because of historical continuity to past measurements. In contrast, other types of instruments are often needed because the mass of nanoparticles is often insignificant compared to larger particles. In this case, we either need new samplers to collect nanoparticles alone or instruments that measure number or surface area concentration. The method of sampling may be manual or direct reading. In manual methods, particles are physically collected, usually onto a filter. These filters are then weighed to determine the mass of the collected material or analyzed chemically to determine the mass of a certain composition of particles. This weight is then divided by the air volume sampled to obtain mass concentration. In contrast, direct reading instruments use some property of an aerosol to obtain a direct readout of concentration. For example, aerosol photometers, which we'll talk about later, use the fact that the amount of light scattered by particles is related to mass concentration. A good manual sampling method has the following characteristics. The collection medium should be safe with a high capture efficiency for the contaminant of interest. The quantity of material collected should be less than the capacity of the collection system. The collected material should be chemically stable until analyzed. And the signal should be well above background noise. We need to collect sufficient mass to be above limits of detection for analysis methods. The location of sampling is also important. Some sampling is done in a specific area of interest, such as that shown in the picture at left near a kitchen grill. This type of sampling allows a lot of flexibility in the types of instruments that we can use. For example, we can move a cart with fairly large instruments into an area to get a detailed measurement of particles in the area of interest. Other times, we sample within the breathing zone of a worker, which we call personal sampling. This sampling requires small, unobtrusive equipment that can be worn by the worker. In the picture at right, a worker is wearing a lapel type sampler that collects particles with an efficiency mimicking aspiration and or deposition of particles in the respiratory tract. An airflow pump, typically worn on the belt of the worker, is used to pull air through the sampler to simulate breathing. Personal sampling is usually required to demonstrate compliance with occupational exposure limits. Sampling the environment representatively is another major concern when sampling for particles. Sampling consists of aspirating particles into an inlet and transporting them to a filter or other type of collection device or sensor for detection. Both aspiration and transport are dependent on the characteristics of the particle with size being predominant and the airflow characteristics of sampling. Aspiration also depends on whether particles are being sampled from moving air, such as in a duct, or from still air.
Special care needs to be taken to ensure representative sampling of particles in moving air, such as the air in a duct of a local exhaust system or in smokestack emissions testing depicted here. Air is pulled from the moving airstream with a sampling probe. Representative sampling is achieved when the probe is aligned with the airflow and the velocity of air entering the probe is equal to the velocity of air in the stack, isokinetic sampling. If the probe is misaligned, small particles will be sampled representatively, but the inertia of large particles will cause them to sometimes miss being sampled and consequently be undersampled. In superisokinetic sampling, the velocity of air entering the probe is higher than that in the stack. Again, the inertia of large particles will cause them to be undersampled. Conversely, in subisokinetic sampling, the velocity of air entering the probe is lower than that in the stack. Here, the inertia of large particles causes them to be oversampled. Once particles are aspirated, they need to be transported to the filter or sensor effectively. We have previously talked about particle transport through tubes when we discussed aerosol behavior. Transport through something is characterized by penetration, which is 1 minus the collection efficiency. So in this plot, a penetration of 100% means that all particles pass through the tube or are transported to the other side. And 0% means that all of the particles hit the walls of the tube and do not transport to the other side. Very small particles tend to diffuse to the walls, resulting in low penetration, so shorter tubes are better for nanoparticles. Medium-sized particles, like the orange particle, go with the flow and have high penetration efficiency. Big particles, the green particle shown in the figure, settle due to gravity and tend to collect on the bottom of the walls of the tube and have low penetration, which again favors short tubes. Bends can cause particles to deposit on walls due to inertia, so minimizing the number of bends in a tube is also favorable. There are many different types of sampling instruments. We can group these samplers into categories, including manual instruments that are size integrated, such as open filters or size selective samplers, and size resolved samplers, such as impactors or devices that collect samples for microscopy. We can also group these samplers into direct reading instruments. Direct reading instruments that provide an indication of particle concentration integrated over many particle size, such as photometers and condensation particle counters, or that provide size resolved data in real time, the optical particle counter, aerodynamic particle sizer, and scanning mobility particle sizer. Let's start with size integrated manual methods. Most of these methods provide a measurement of particle mass concentration. Thus, I depict average mass concentration integrated over many different size diameters on the concentration by size plot. I will sample with a filter, with or without a size selective device, over a fairly long sample time period, typically 8 hours for occupational and 24 hours for environmental sampling. Then I get some indication of particle concentration for particles of many different sizes. Often, particles are collected onto filters for subsequent analysis. As we have seen, filters collect a range of particles with varying efficiency depending on how they are made. The combined effect of diffusion and impaction results in a collection efficiency curve that is typical of filters. 
Here I show particle collection efficiency by particle size. The purple curve is typical of a low efficiency filter, like a low cost furnace filter. High collection efficiency is achieved for very small particles, say about smaller than 10 nanometers due to diffusion, and for very large particles, larger than 5 micrometers due to impaction. However, the lowest collection efficiencies occur for particles in the middle size range, about 300 nanometers, because diffusion and impaction have the least effect on these particle sizes. These size particles just pass through the filter, going with the airflow. Air sampling filters are designed to have high collection efficiency for all sizes. Thus, particles collect if they are able to pass into the filter. Typically, filters are sold for air sampling, already installed in filter cassettes. Here we see a filter in a filter cassette, which is then clipped to the lapel of a worker. Airflow is pulled from the breathing zone through the filter by a belt mounted air pump. The filter cassette is composed of a bottom section which holds a support pad and the air sampling filter. These components are held in place with a ring that is press fit into the bottom section. The filter cassettes can be operated with a top inlet for closed face sampling or without the top inlet which is called open faced sampling. We've also seen this before. Often certain sized particles are excluded from reaching the filter in an effort to mimic some aspect of particle behavior in the human respiratory system. This type of sampling is called size selective sampling. Previously, we discussed how particles deposit in the human respiratory tract, resulting in the plot shown here. 300 nanometers size particles have the lowest deposition efficiency. Only about 15% of them deposit when inhaled, whereas 85% are breathed back out without depositing. The fraction of particles depositing in the respiratory system increases for particles smaller than about 300 nanometers due to diffusion. For particles larger than 300 nanometers, deposition increases due to inertial deposition, primarily in the head airways, although they also deposit by gravitational settling if they pass into the alveolar region. Gravitational settling makes particles larger than approximately 5 micron, increasingly difficult to aspirate into the human body. Many occupational regulations require that particles are collected with specific sampling efficiencies called sampling criteria, which are based on deposition in the human respiratory system. Inhalable samplers collect those particles that can be aspirated into the human respiratory tract. So the inhalable criterion, shown in blue, follows the respiratory deposition fraction for particles larger than 5 micrometers. Shown in yellow, the thoracic criterion is designed to collect only those particles that pass the head airways, nominally smaller than 10 micrometers. And shown in green, samplers based on the respirable criterion collect only those particles that can pass through to the deep lung, nominally smaller than 4 micrometers. Inhalable samplers are designed to aspirate particles like the human mouth and nose. Examples of inhalable samplers are the IOM sampler, IOM stands for Institute of Medicine, that has an opening a bit like a mouth with the filter partially exposed. Another sampler is the button sampler that has a perforated metal sphere that provides more protection for the filter.
In this animation, we can see air entering the inhalable sampler developed by the Institute of Medicine, or IOM. The motion of very large particles is dominated by gravity settling, causing them to be unaffected by the airflow entering the sampler. Approximately 50% of 100 micrometer particles will be aspirated into the inlet of the sampler, mimicking the behavior of the human nose and mouth. Smaller particles are aspirated with increasing efficiency as they are more easily carried by the airflow into the sampler. Various vendors sell different size selective cyclones, such as the aluminum and BGI respirable cyclones. Air entering the cyclone is forced to spin several times with larger particles hitting the wall and being forced to collect in a grit pot in the tip of the cyclone. The smaller or respirable particles remain airborne and pass to a filter often housed in a filter cassette like that shown here. There are also size selective impactors such as the personal exposure monitor PEM sampler or the parallel particle impactor. In these samplers larger particles collect on an impaction plate and the smaller particles that remain airborne are collected on a filter. The parallel particle impactor is unique in that it has different diameter impactor nozzles to produce a collection efficiency curve that closely matches either a thoracic or respirable criterion at different airflow rates. Once a sample is collected, there are different ways to analyze it. One of the most common is gravimetric analysis. Pre and post sampling, the filter is conditioned in a room with a controlled temperature and relative humidity. Any charge on the filter is neutralized and then the filter is weighed on a specialized balance. The weight gained during sampling is interpreted as the mass of collected particles. Mass concentration is then calculated as the mass of collected particles divided by the air flow rate and sampling time or air flow rate times time is also sample volume. The result is milligrams per meter cubed so milligrams of particles divided by meter cubed of air. Sometimes it's also expressed as micrograms, so micrograms per meter cubed of air. Alternatively, particles collected on a filter can be analyzed chemically. This involves digestion of the air filter and particles to transfer the collected particles into a phase suitable for analysis often liquid, analysis of the digestate, and then reporting. There are numerous methods of analysis, which I will discuss briefly here. Reporting is the same as in gravimetric analysis, except that the mass is determined chemically rather than with a microbalance. The NIOSH Manual of Analytical Methods, or NMAM, is an excellent resource for determining applicable sampling, digestion, and analysis methods. I'll show you method 7301, which is called Elements by Inductively Coupled Plasma, ICP, with digestion by aqua regia ashing, as an example. At the top section of this method, we see that there are many elements that can be determined using ICP, such as aluminum, cadmium, copper, manganese, to name a few. Below the list of target elements, there are more important details. Sampling is described in the box 
on the left, sampling with 0.8 micrometer cellulose ester membrane or 5 micrometer polyvinyl chloride membrane filters at 1 to 4 liter per minute as specified. These filters are to be digested by immersion in aqua regia, which is a combination of nitric and hydrochloric acid. Then, the analysis of the digestate is specified as inductively coupled plasma with atomic emission spectroscopy. There are numerous ways to analyze samples. One type is absorption spectrophotometry. A certain wavelength of light is passed through the sample. The reduction in the intensity of light is proportional to the quantity of material in the sample. UV, for instance, can be used for mercury, aromatics, phenols, iodine, nitrates, and PAHs, whereas infrared can be used for chlorinated compounds. In atomic absorption spectroscopy, or AAS, a lamp is used to produce light with a wavelength specific to a certain element. The light is passed through a flame, the sample is injected into the flame, and the quantity of light absorbed is proportional to the quantity of a specific element in the sample. As an alternative to a flame, plasma can be used to excite a sample. In inductively coupled plasma, ICP, induction coils are used to generate plasma that is 7 or 8,000 Kelvin in temperature. A sample is injected into this plasma. The plasma excites the atoms of some of the elements in the sample. These excited atoms are then further analyzed by either atomic emission spectroscopy or mass spectroscopy. Atomic emission spectroscopy is a way to determine if certain substances are present and if so, their quantity. Different spectra are emitted when different compounds are present in a flame or plasma. So here we can see in the picture if there is zero calcium in my sample, I have very little light emitted by that sample. As the calcium concentration goes up, 10 milligrams, I get a, a light orange color, and then a very high concentration, I get a bright yellow color. Oftentimes, mass spectroscopy is used to analyze samples excited by inductively coupled plasma. Ionized fragments of the sample are accelerated and separated according to their mass to charge ratio. The resulting spectra are compared to libraries of known compounds to determine exactly what compounds are present in the sample. From time to time, NIOSH issues current intelligence bulletins, CIBs. They did so in 2011 for titanium dioxide, a white powder used in many products such as whiteners and in sunscreens. In the CIB, NIOSH reviewed current literature showing that small titanium dioxide particles elicit more inflammation than larger particles for a given mass dose. They considered this toxicological data in the context of the only applicable occupational exposure limit for titanium dioxide, which at the time was the OSHA permissible exposure limit for particles not otherwise regulated, which has a value of 15 milligrams per meter cubed. They then recommended exposure limits of 2.4 milligrams per meter cubed for fine titanium dioxide and 0.3 milligrams per meter cubed for ultrafine titanium dioxide. The CIB further outlines how the exposures should be assessed for titanium dioxide. This protocol is complicated by the fact that we do not have a sampler that measures particles in the nano and fine fractions. Two respirable samplers are taken. 
one on a PVC filter and the other on a mixed cellulose ester filter, MCE filter. The PVC filter is to be analyzed by inductively coupled plasma for titanium. If this sample is less than 0.3 milligrams per meter cubed, then no further action is needed. If it's greater than 2.4 milligrams per meter cubed, then the REL is exceeded and control should be implemented. If, however, the titanium dioxide content is between 0.3 and 2.4, the duplicate mixed cellulose ester filter should be analyzed by transmission electron microscopy to apportion the mass into fine and ultrafine particle size fractions. In 2012, CJ Tsai and collaborators introduced a special sampler called the Personal Nanoparticle Sampler, PENS. This sampler consists of a respirable cyclone followed by an impactor with a sharp cut at 100 nanometers. The filter in the filter cassette then collects only the respirable nanoparticles. This sampler is favorable because collection of nanoparticles separately from larger particles eliminates the need for electron microscopy, which is expensive. However, the sampler does have a high pressure drop that requires bulky sampling pumps. Lorenzo Chena, a student working in my laboratory, took a different approach. He defined a new sampling criterion that was given the name the nanoparticulate matter criterion. This criterion is analogous to inhalable, thoracic, and respirable sampling criteria. However, a sampler matching this criterion will collect nanoparticles as they deposit in the respiratory tract. He then developed a sampler that matches the nanoparticulate matter criterion. Shown here, the sampler consists of a respirable cyclone to aspirate particles, an impaction stage that removes particles larger than 300 nanometers, and finally a diffusion stage to sample nanoparticles like the respiratory tract. Again, this sampler could allow nanoparticle exposure assessment without the need for microscopy. It also can be operated with most traditional belt-mounted sampling pumps because the collection mechanism is based on diffusion. Now we'll move into size-resolved manual methods, such as the cascade impactor to directly measure mass distributions, or microscopy to directly measure number distributions. Cascade impactors provide a way to collect particles in different size ranges. Cascade impactors pull air through a single inlet and then a series of impaction stages that collect smaller and smaller particles. Some samplers used in area sampling are quite large, such as the Nano Moody impactor shown here. The Nano Moody allows particles to be sampled into 14 size bins ranging from 20 nanometers to 10 micrometers. Small versions are available for personal sampling that can be operated with belt mounted sampling pumps but can be used for particles larger than 500 nanometers and have fewer stages so there's less sizing resolution. Each stage of a cascade impactor must be analyzed separately to obtain size resolved data. Stages can be pre and post weighed to directly measure the mass of all particles or analyzed chemically to directly measure the mass of a certain chemical species. Here I show measurements of welding fume sampled with a nano moody and with each stage analyzed by inductively coupled mass spectroscopy. On the left, we have a plot of mass concentration of iron by particle size. The error bars represent the standard deviation for three replicate measurements. 
These size resolve data allow us to see modes in the size distribution. Most of the mass is associated with fine particles, but there are also coarse particles in this sample. With ICPMS, we can also obtain information on other elements at the same time. The plot on the right shows the size distribution for chromium. And again, we see most of the material is in the fine mode, with some of the chromium also showing up in the coarse mode. Although these data provide a wealth of information, they are time intensive and costly to produce. There are special collection devices for microscopy. Filters often have a complicated structure, making it difficult to identify particles apart from the filter media. Instead, we need a flat featureless surface to maximize our ability to see particles with microscopy. One way to achieve this is by electrostatic precipitation. The ESP Nano is a specific instrument that is available for this purpose. In this device, particles in an incoming airstream are electrically charged and then attracted to and deposit on oppositely charged substrate suitable for electron microscopy. An alternative way to collect particles is to use a thermal precipitator. In a thermal precipitator, particles move from hot to cold in a thermal gradient. Particles can be deposited onto a substrate suitable for electron microscopy by placing the substrate on a cold surface in this thermal gradient. A commercial version of this device is available from RJ Lee Group. Once particles are collected on the substrate, there can be detailed characterization of the features of individual particles such as that shown here. This particle was produced when commercial products are sanded that contain nanomaterials. So here there's a large particle that contains carbon nanotubes and the carbon nanotubes can be seen protruding from the sample. These particles can also be analyzed in order to directly measure number concentration. Light microscopy is limited to particles roughly larger than the wavelength of light, or about 500 nanometers. Scanning electron and transmission electron microscopy allow detection to much smaller particle sizes, around 50 nanometers for scanning and 10 nanometers for electron microscopy. From analysis of pictures, the number concentration of particles can be binned by particle size. The state of the art in microscopy is computer control of the microscope with energy dispersive spectroscopy. The computer drives the microscope until a particle is found, then the size and morphology of the particle are assessed by image analysis. Finally, the composition of the particle is determined from emitted x-rays by energy disperses spectroscopy. Such a technology is exciting because we can then figure out what portion of the size distribution is due to certain types of particles, such as engineered nanoparticles. Now we're going to move on to size integrated direct reading instruments. These include photometers that scale with mass concentration, surface area monitors, and number counting devices. These direct reading devices are more commonly used in industrial hygiene profession to supplement personal filter measurements. This animation depicts the operating principle of an aerosol photometer. Air is sampled through an inlet from the environment. Part of this air is passed through a filter and used as sheath air to protect the optics. The remaining air with particles passes through a sensing zone. The sensing zone is illuminated with light from a laser diode focused with lenses. The light 
passing directly through the instrument is prevented from bouncing back into the sensing zone with a light stop. Particles in the sensing zone scatter light, which is detected with a photomultiplier tube. If we take a closer look, we can see that the photo photomultiplier tube responds to the light scattered by an assembly of particles. When there is a high concentration, more light is scattered, and when there is less, lower concentration, less light is scattered. Aerosol photometers provide output that is proportional to mass concentration. The units reported by these instruments are either milligrams per meter cubed or micrograms per meter cubed. They work over a size range roughly 500 nanometers or 0.5 micrometers to 10 micrometers. Smaller particles don't scatter enough light to be seen and larger particles are difficult to aspirate into the inlet. The calibration is sensitive to optical properties and that's a major drawback of these devices. Many of them have a filter in them so that you can collect a filter at the same time as you are getting the real-time information off of the display. Examples of these devices include the TSI Dust Tract or a PDR, Personal Data RAM 1500 from Thermo Scientific. This animation depicts the operating principle of a condensation particle counter. This device is extremely useful for detecting nanoparticle concentrations in the workplace, such as finding a leak in an enclosure. Particle concentrations are low where there is no leak, but high where there is a leak. Taking a look inside the device, particles are pulled into an inlet. A portion of those particles are passed through to a detection region. This detection region is similar to a photometer in that scattered light is detected. However, the light scattered by nanoparticles is so small that it is undetectable with a photomultiplier tube. For this reason, the condensation particle counter has two additional components, a saturator held at high temperature and a condenser held at low temperature. These two components cause the particle to grow sufficiently large to scatter light and be counted in the optical section. If we look at a single particle moving through the system, the particle is dry when entering the inlet. It stays the same size as it passes through the saturator, but the air becomes saturated with a working fluid, usually water or alcohol, that comes from a wetted wick within the saturator. This working fluid then condenses onto the particle, causing it to grow as it moves through the condenser. These particles are then easily counted in the optics region. Condensation particle counters are available that provide particle number concentration in units of particles per centimeter cubed. These numbers are associated with particle sizes smaller than one micrometer. There are personal versions that are becoming available at this time However, they're not in widespread use and they're quite expensive at this time, upwards of $15,000 or more. There are different versions that are on the market from TSI Incorporated, for instance. There's a P-Track. Cost is around $7,000, has a lower size range of 20 nanometers and a maximum concentration of 500,000 particles per centimeter cubed. There's also a CPC3007. We've used that as a workhorse in our laboratory for doing exposure assessments. The cost of that is around $9,000, has a lower size range of 10 nanometers, and a maximum concentration of 100,000 particles per centimeter cubed. Electrical diffusion classifiers have recently become available in personal models for the measurement of sub-micrometer aerosols. Here I show 
the schematic diagram for the disk mini. Aerosol enters the inlet and particles are electrically charged. Ions in the air are removed by an induction stage. Then the smallest particles deposit onto diffusion screens and the remaining particles deposit on a backup filter. The particle number, lung deposited surface area, and mean diameter are estimated from the electrical charge that drains from the diffusion and filter stages. Direct reading instruments provide a lot of data, such as mass and number concentration by time. These instruments can be used in different ways, such as summarized through descriptive statistics. Often these data are used to associate peak exposures with certain worker process or activities. Although not used for compliance purposes, these instruments can provide critical information for making sound decisions on how best to control workplace aerosol concentrations. The last category that I will discuss are size resolved direct reading instruments. These are the top shelf of aerosol measurements. Most are quite expensive and large, restricting their use to specialty area sampling only. Optical particle counters provide number concentration of particles by size, typically from 300 nanometers to 20 micrometers. Here I show the optical configuration of the Grimm Particle Dust Monitor 1108. The light from a laser diode is shaped with lenses to illuminate a sensing volume. A detector measures the intensity of the light scattered by each particle that enters the sensing volume. The intensity of scattered light is used to classify the particle by size with larger particles scattering more light than smaller ones. An aerodynamic particle sizer uses the principle of inertia to size particles. An aerosol is rapidly accelerated through two laser beams. A photomultiplier tube is used to measure the light scattered by the particle as it passes through the beams, creating two light pulses. The time that it takes to traverse the two beams is called the time of flight. Small particles, roughly less than 500 nanometers, accelerate rapidly to the same speed as the air in the nozzle. The inertial properties of larger particles causes them to increasingly deviate from the airflow velocity and having longer and longer time of flights. In this way, particles can be counted and sized at the same time. The scanning mobility particle sizer uses electrical forces to size submicrometer aerosols. Aerosol is first neutralized and then passed through the outside wall of a column in an electrostatic size classifier. A clean sheath air is passed over a negatively charged rod. The negative charged rod attracts positively charged particles. The particles of one size pass through a slit in the lower section of the collection rod and are counted with a condensation particle counter, or CPC. This device can be used to measure particle number concentration by size from 3 nanometers to 800 nanometers. Sizers provide a wealth of data. These data shown here are from a st study of nanoparticles in the city of Pittsburgh. In the top plot, a color scale is used to indicate particle number concentration from low values blue to high values red. Particle size is shown on the y-axis by time of day on the x-axis. Each slice of the data represents a size distribution measured at a particular time. Early in the morning, for instance, about 3 a.m., there was a background level of particles in the air, but in the afternoon, the particle size distribution had changed dramatically. 
These data can help understand sources of aerosols in various air sheds or occupational settings. Lastly, I will cover the top of the top shelf of aerosol instruments. Aerosol time of flight mass spectrometry. First, a particle is sized by measuring its time of flight. Then it is vaporized into elemental fragments that are measured in a mass spectrometer. The mass spectra of these fragments can be used to determine the composition of the particle. As you can imagine, this device costs a lot, about $300,000 to $500,000, and it generates a ridiculous amount of data that need to be analyzed. Although impractical for most occupational hygiene, it represents a combination of techniques that we have seen before and perhaps with a lot of miniaturization could be the Star Trek tricorder that we are looking for. Here I summarize the sampling instruments that we have discussed today. I've organized the instruments into categories of manual or direct reading instruments and integrated or sizing. I've also used color to indicate the type of data that they provide with magenta indicating mass concentration, orange indicating surface area concentration, and blue indicating number concentration. These instruments scan a wide variety of sizes and there is no one instrument that adequately solves all of the needs for sampling and so it's important to understand what these different instruments bring to the table when you select certain instruments for sampling. Finally, to summarize, we've reviewed different types of instruments used to measure airborne particles in the workplace. We discussed their operating principles and the output that they provide with regard to size resolution, time resolution, and concentration metric. Lastly, we discussed how the output of these devices can be used to understand workplace exposures. This lesson has been created by the Midwest Emerging Technologies Public Health and Safety Training METFAST program, a collaboration of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, the University of Iowa College of Public Health, and Dakota County Technical College. Funding for the METFAST program is provided by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences of the National Institutes of Health. The content of this lesson is solely the responsibility of the developers and does not necessarily represent the official views of National Institutes of Health.